We welcome you back into the Tell Me Teaching Series as we continue to look at 1 John chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. Now, in our last session, we received a lot of questions, a lot of questions with regard to 1 John chapter 3, verse 2. And we want to go, we want to go back and we want to revisit that scripture because there was sufficient amount of questions from the pastors with regard to specifically verse 2. And we're talking about the proof, the proof that one really loves God. And there are six tests that are laid out for us in the in the first book of John chapter, with chapter 1 all the way to all the way to chapter 5. And we see this very, very clearly. So we're still looking at number 1. So let's go into the text and begin to respond to a multitude of questions that came in specifically about verse 2 from our last teaching session. And remember that I'm, I'm teaching out of the New American Standard Version of the Bible. So let's look at 1 John chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. And it says, See how great a love the Father. See how great a love the Father has bestowed on us, that we will be called children of God. And as such, we are. For this reason, the world does not know us, because it did not know Him. Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not appeared, it has not yet, it has not appeared as yet what we will be. We know then, we know that when He appears, when He appears, we will be like Him, because we will see Him just as He is. And everyone who has this hope fixed on Him purifies Himself just as He is. And we were looking at the first of all, we started out looking at the first test out of the six, which is experiencing God's incredible love. Experiencing God's incredible love. And that's what we decided to examine at first, right? And that's what we were looking at. So there are six tests that measure our love for God, and the six tests will show if and how much we really love God. That's what the whole, that's what the entire main subject is in 1 John chapter 3, verses 1, all the way to 1 John chapter 4, verse 21. So the first test is the discussion of the present passage here. Have we experienced God's incredible love? So let's go back now, and we and we spent a lot of time in our last session looking at verse one. Today I'm going to re and, and I want to revisit verse two because this is where all the questions come in. And the main subject here is Jesus' return, and there is this great hope and the mystery of God's love, okay, the eternal transformation that believers shall undergo. So let's go, so this, this is the transformation part that we're going to be looking at today. And in verse 2 he says, Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not appeared as yet what we will be. We know that when he appears, we will be like him, because we will see him just as he is. Now, we're going to have to combine a couple of scriptures together to get at the root of <clears throat> answering this question about what does he mean that the believer takes on the form? He will appear like him. We will be like him. And there was a multitude of questions all surrounding basically the same thing, different wording, but it's the basically the same question. So I want to ask you to open your Bibles, hold your place in 1 John chapter 3, 2, and go with me to Philippians chapter 2, verse 6. Philippians chapter 2, verse 6. Because the scripture also says here in Philippians, Philippians 2, 6, that he was in the form of God. Now, this is talking about he, Christ, was in the form of God. Now, in the Greek language that we would call that the emorphe, the emorphe theo, okay? And that's what that means, right? So believers shall be in the form of God. Now, we're going to be, the, and we're, we're not the emorphe theo, we're going to be the sumo for a. Okay, which is a different concept here. Look at Philippians 2, 6. He says, Who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped. Now, the believer is to have a form. We're going to have a form or a morphe in the Greek language, okay? Just like the image... Okay, which is going to be the eonx, the eonx of Christ. Okay, that's the other word, the image in Greek is eonx. Okay, and, it, and in other words, resemble him, resemble him. And this is the part that, that where the questions came in, resemble him in perfection, resemble him in perfection as much as his very image is stamped with perfection. The whole precious idea. Okay, is that Jesus Christ took the believer and purified him and exalted him. Purified him and exalted him. Therefore, the believer is to partake of the purity and the holiness of Christ. This is what we're talking about here in verse 2, 1 John chapter 3. Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not appeared as yet as we will be. 
we know that when he appears we will be like him we'll be like him because we will see him just as he is and we can see this later on in the book of Romans and in Romans chapter 8 it says here in verse 29 Romans 8 29 it says for those whom he foreknew he also predestined us to become conform to the image of his son so that we will be the firstborn among money among many brethren now this much is known and we mentioned this the last time this much is known about the body that we shall receive it will be a body just like the body that Jesus Christ has that's the point here hmm? now these old broken down bodies that we have here on earth okay is not what's going to be in heaven we're going to be transformed, okay? That's what we call the glorification, okay? We're going to have the same perfect body of purity and perfection as Jesus Christ. Now, this is made abundantly clear by the glorious promise, of, okay, of Scripture. Look, look what he says in Philippians chapter 3, verse 21. Turn your Bibles over to Philippians 3, 21, and let's look at these glorious promises that we have in Scripture. It says here in Philippians 3.21, he says, Who will transform the body of our humble state into conformity with the body of his glory by the exertion of the power that he has even to subject all things to himself? Earlier in the Gospels, turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 13, verse 43. Earlier in the Gospels, we see it stated this way. He says in Matthew 13, 43, Then the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears, let him ear. We are going to shine forth in the same righteousness of Jesus Christ. Now go back to Romans chapter 8. And look at me in verse 17, Romans chapter 8, verse 17. And he says, And if children, heirs, heirs also heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, so that we may be also be glorified with him. We're going to be glorified with him. Remember I told you earlier that we're talking about we're going to have the same perfect body. Uh, it's a body of perfection and purity. Hmm? Well, look at what he says in the book of Colossians, chapter 3, verse 4. And in Colossians, chapter 3, verse 4, he says, When Christ, who is our life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him, what? You're going to also be revealed with him in glory. In glory. Do you see that? Hmm? Well, go to the end of the Bible and go to the book of Revelation, chapter 22, verse 5. Now, remember what I'm doing here. I've taken, I've taken 34 questions, okay, that have come in with regard to this particular passage in 1 John chapter 3, verse 2. And what I'm doing is I've combined it because they're all asking basically the same thing, different phraseology, different wording, but the intent and the content of the questions were the same. And in the book of Revelation, chapter 22, we see this in verse 5, where he says, And there will no longer be any night, and they will not have any need of light of a lamp, nor the light of the sun, because, why? Because the Lord God will illuminate them, and they will reign forever and ever and ever. We shall be what? We shall be conformed to the image of His Son. We're going to be conformed to His image. Well, let me show you this. Go back to Romans chapter 8 and look at verse 29. In Romans chapter 8, verse 29, and he says this, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his Son, so that we would be the firstborn among many brethren. Well, later on in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, turn your Bibles there, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and look what he says here in verse 49, verse 49. And he says, just as we have been born, just as we have been born in the, in the image of the earthly, we will also bear the image of of the heavenly what's the image of the heavenly that's the image of Jesus Christ now in that in that same book now go to 2nd Corinthians and in 2nd Corinthians chapter 3 look what he says in verse 18 2nd Corinthians chapter 3 verse 18 but we all with unveiled face beholding as in a mirror of the glory of the Lord we are being transformed into the same image 
from glory to glory, just as from the Lord, the Spirit. Just as from the Lord, the Spirit. Now, the Bible tells us that we're going to be just like him. We shall be like him. Who is him? Him is Christ, right? We shall be like him. We shall see him as he is. In 1 John chapter 3, now let's go back to where we started. In 1 John chapter 3, and look at verse 2, where he says, Beloved, now we are children of God, comma, and it has not appeared as yet as we will, and it has not appeared as yet what we will be, we know that when he appears, we will be like him because we will see him just as he is. Now, the body of the believer okay, is to undergo a radical, radical change. Just as the Lord's body was radically changed, our body is going to be radically changed. Now, remember, Jesus went to the cross. He was crucified. He was beaten. Okay? And he and he was and he was and he and he died. He was buried, right? But in his resurrection, okay, and you and we get a glimpse of this. We just get a little glimpse of it, okay, in, in the Mount Transfiguration, where we see his glory, okay, and his majesty, his majestic essence, okay, is now being illuminated for us. And we see the three witnesses, okay, where you have Peter and John and so forth. They're up there and they see this, okay, in the Mount Transfiguration. Well, that body goes through a radical change because when it was resurrected, the body of Jesus was resurrected, okay? And remember, later on, he appears to about more or less about 500 people, okay? We see that laid out in the scriptures, especially in the Gospel of John. We see this very clearly, okay? And it's laid out for us, okay? and it's mentioned again in, the, in, the, in 1 Corinthians. And we see this. Now, that radical change of that body, okay, that's the kind of radical change that's going to happen to the believer, to the believer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I want you to see that. Mm -hmm. Now, there are several changes that are promised. Now, there are several changes that are promised to the believer. Let me show you this. Turn your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 42. 1 Corinthians chapter, look at it, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 42. And the first thing I want you to know is that the body will not be a corruptible, but an incorruptible body. The body will not be corruptible, but it will be an incorruptible body. How do we know this? Well, in verse 49, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, he says, So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in perishable body, but it is raised in imperishable body. It is sown as a corruptible body, but it is going to be raised as an incorruptible body. Now, our earthly body is corruptible. Our, resur resur our resurrected body will be incorruptible. Corruptible means that our bodies age, they deteriorate, um, they die, uh, they decay, and they decompose. We understand that, okay? But our heavenly bodies will differ radically, absolutely radically, okay? They shall be incorruptible, imperishable. They will never age. They will never deteriorate. They will never die. They will never decay. They will never decompose. Mm -hmm. They will be transformed and never, never, ever perish. They will be completely free from the defilement, completely free from the depravity, and to, to keep, uh, completely free from death and decay. Mm -hmm. The second thing that is promised to the believer, okay, is that the body will not be a body of dishonor. A body will not be a body of dishonor, but a resurrected body of glory. Now go to the next verse in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 43. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 43. And he says, in he says, it is sown in dishonor. What is sown in dishonor? This earthly body is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. Now, our earthly body is buried in what? In dishonor. Our resurrected body will be raised in glory. Our body is dishonorable, and nothing shows the body's dishonor any more than death and burial. That's the, that's the height of dishonor, is when this old carcass has got to be buried. Okay? Now, every human body is ultimately, listen to this carefully, every human body is ultimately shamed and disgraced and degraded and deprived of all of it has. Every human body is doomed to become nothing more than a handful of 
dirt. That's it, dirt. Think about it. Nothing could be any more dishonorable than to take the wonderful mechanism and the beauty of a man's body and see it become nothing more than dirt. Yet that is exactly what happens. But not the resurrected body. Did you hear what I said? But not the resurrected body. The human body will be transformed into a body of glory. A body of glory. Glory means to possess and to be full of perfect light. It means to be possessed and to be full of glory, of perfect light, to dwell in the perfect light, to dwell in the perfect brilliance, to, to dwell in the perfect splendor, to dwell in the in the perfect brightness, to dwell in the perfect luster, to, to, to dwell in the perfect magnificence, to dwell in the perfect dignity, to dwell in the perfect majesty, to dwell in the perfect grace of God himself. And the third thing is this is that the body will not be a body of weakness, but a body of power. The body will not be a body of weakness, but a body of power. Now, go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 43. He says, it is sown in dishonor. What is sown in dishonor? The earthly body is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is raised in power power. Look, our earthly body is buried in weakness. Our resurrected body is raised in power. While on earth our body is ever so weak, it's subject to sickness, um, it, it, it's subject to disease, it, it's subject to a host of other infirmities and limitations, and eventually it becomes so weak that it, it, look, it dies. That's what happens to our body, okay? So in death, the human body is utterly powerless powerless it's helpless it's devoid of any strength and the capability of whatsoever in death the human body is so powerless it is unable to lift a single finger it can do nothing absolutely nothing now the resurrected body however is raised in power it shall have a mind and a body that's filled with strength, it's going to be filled with might, it's going to fill, be filled with um, health, it's going to be filled with authority, it's going to be filled with control. It will be a perfect body, never subject to disease, never subject to accident, never subject to suffering. It will be a body so powerful that it will be able to control its acts and the circumstances around it all for good. I wanted to take this time to simply respond to those 34 questions that, evol that, re that was revolving around 1 John chapter 3, verse 2, where he says, Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not appeared as yet as what we will be. We know that when he appears, we will be like him, because we will see him just as he is. I pray that this brought some clarity as to what this verse is talking about. And we'll pick this up in our next session when we drop down to verse 3.